Y vamos a terminar con una novela policíaca. We will end with a detective story. The King of Spain, Charles II, the bewitched, dies. The Spanish crown is left vacant, though, if I am not mistaken, Charles II has chosen a successor in his will, the future Philip V. The war of the Spanish succession erupts, in which two major European dynasties, the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, or House of Austria, oppose each other and the different European powers take a position. Spain becomes the center of operations for the war, which lasts a considerable length of time. The Austrian and English armies fight against the Spanish and French armies. There are Spaniards on both sides. France is utterly drained. The public coffers of the King of France are depleted by the cost of the war. Well, when the underage Louis XV inherits the throne, the regent, Philippe d'Orléans, takes over running the country. In the midst of that desperate situation, a Scottish financier named John Law arrives in Paris and promises the regent a solution to all his problems. So, you have no cash on hand? Not to worry. We'll make some. How? We'll set up a government bank and issue paper currency. Damn, what an excellent idea. Why haven't we thought of that before? Law, the Scotsman, is appointed Controller General of Finances of France, and he immediately starts to put his system into operation. He establishes a government bank. He begins to expand credit and issue paper money. And, since expansions always require an underlying asset, they invent the Mississippi Trading Company. They tell people that Louisiana, a southern U.S. state named in honor of none other than King Louis, is practically paradise. They say it is exceptionally rich. That is all a lie. Louisiana was full of marshes, swamps, and mosquitoes, and nothing could be done about it. But since there was no internet back then, and nobody flew in airplanes, etc., people believed the lie. So anyway, they create the Mississippi Trading Company with a monopoly on commerce with the area, which is supposedly so rich. The French begin to invest in the Mississippi Trading Company's stocks on a large scale, and their price shoots up due to the increase in monetary expansion generated by Law's entire system. Soon, after a few months, a few years, it becomes clear that it has all been a sham, that nothing is coming from the Mississippi. Incidentally, the capital of Louisiana is New Orleans, in whose honor? Philippe Dolain. The whole system collapses, the bank fails, and thousands and thousands of French people are ruined. And in fact, for many years in France, the word banker is considered bad taste and an insult. Everything collapses. Now we must mention a young Irishman who has had to leave Ireland and take refuge in France and Spain. The English Protestants have expropriated his family's assets. Since he speaks English and is brilliant, he ends up acting as the straw man for the English Minister of Defense. And why does the English Minister of Defense want a straw man at the height of the War of Succession? Well, very simple. At the time of our story, unlike today, a man could have his public life, member of parliament and the cabinet, minister of defense in an international conflict, and his private life, in which he set up a little business to launch companies to provision the English soldiers in Spain. It will not surprise you to hear that most of the time, the rifles did not shoot very well. The gunpowder was not of the best quality, etc. Anyway, this man becomes enormously rich, because the demand, which is funded by the English treasury, is huge, and he is the supplier. But he needs a straw man, and that straw man is Richard Cantillon, who does business in Spain during the War of Succession. Cantillon makes a small fortune, and later ends up in France, in Paris, where an uncle leaves him a small banking house, which grows dramatically right away, because Cantillon becomes the trendiest banker and also many exiles in France are his customers. In addition, Cantillon is the founder of economic science. He authors a little book titled Essay on the Nature of Trade in General, which is published posthumously and contains the first analysis of the market process and entrepreneurship. 
Apart from the analysis provided by the scholastics, Cantillon's is closest to the one which would later be developed by theorists of the Austrian school, to which I belong. Anyway, regarding banking, Cantillon knows that everything happening in Paris, the entire bubble, the continual daily increase in the value of stocks, rests on a spurious foundation, the wild speculation induced by John Law and his government bank, which issues paper currency not backed by reserves. Cantillon knows the whole thing is going to crumble. And do you know what he does? The initiative does not come from him. He does not need to look for idiots because idiots are bound. They go to him. People continually go to the bank and ask to borrow money to buy shares in the Mississippi Trading Company. And he thinks, hey, if you're crazy, that's your business. He loans substantial sums of money to many French people so they can invest it in those stocks, which keep rising. And they are delighted. They think they have finally found the Philosopher's Stone. We don't need to work. We'll become millionaires day by day without any effort. Yes, sure, Cantillon says. I'll lend you the money, but on one condition, that as collateral, you leave your purchased stocks in the bank as a deposit of fungible and indistinguishable shares. Sure, no problem. We'll leave them with you as collateral, as a guarantee. Okay, perfect. Well, Cantillon is very clever, and just as the shares have almost reached their maximum price, do you know what he does? He takes all of the shares on deposit, which do not belong to him, but to the depositors at his bank, and he sells them, and he pockets the money, multi-millionaire, and he waits patiently. A few months pass, and Law's entire system collapses. The price of the shares drops to a fraction of what it was when Richard Cantillon sold them. Do you know what Richard Cantillon does then? He buys them back and replaces the deposits. And what do you think he does right after that? He demands repayment of the loans he has given his customers, who are now penniless. An immensely profitable deal. However, an employee of Cantillon's blows the whistle. Cantillon is arrested. He spends a few days in jail in Paris. He has to flee to Holland and then to England. He is pursued by all sorts of civil and criminal lawsuits. In fact, the book, Essay on the Nature of Trade in General, at least the essential outline of it, was written as part of his statements of defense for some of those lawsuits. To top it all off, Cantillon is violently murdered. The official story is that his cook, who wants to rob him, kills him and then burns the house down, and the charred body is later found. However, the true story appears to have been different, and Cantillon's most recent biographer, Antoine E. Murphy, an Irish professor specialized in the history of economic thought, suggests a different ending. It turns out that, decades later, all the papers belonging to an Irish gentleman who once lived in England are found in some trunks in Guyana. If to this, we add that Cantillon sold practically his entire fortune shortly before his death, that none of his family members appeared to be saddened by his passing, and that the supposed murderer did not have the profile of a criminal, it seems probable that Cantillon, who was very clever and rich, staged his own death. In a nutshell, he paid some thugs to produce the body of a beggar. He put the body in his house after selling off all he owned, he had a ship ready, he set a match to the house, Cantillon put on a false beard, and he went to America. And that was his solution to the string of lawsuits and criminal complaints that had pursued him since he was discovered in Paris. Ladies and gentlemen, truth is much stranger than fiction.